And now, ladies and gentlemen, here she is, the one and only Kathy Griffin. came on a good night. <laughs> yeah, let me just say, I'm gonna be so politically incorrect, you might get sued just for being in the audience. <laughs> I, I'm pissing off everybody. I'm naming names. I'm telling tales out of school. <laughs> there are gonna be a lot of people that aren't gonna be talking to any of us tomorrow. <laughs> Here's the thing, I know I'm negative, all right? People talk about positive energy. I, um, I'd like to be positive, I just don't have time. I really don't. <laughs> I'm very busy being negative all day. I'm, I am booked. So, all right, I'm going after everybody. I'm going after Paltrow, fuck her. Fuck her. <laughs> sick of it. I'm sick of it. I'm a nervous wreck. I'm fighting the butt crack sweat right now. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> My, all right, look. Let me set the tone. Um, let me, let me lower the bar. My butt crack sweat is so profound, I'm afraid to turn around. I mean, it, anything could happen. I'm gonna get a spittoon and a bucket and just have it below. If somebody could dab me every so often, I'd really appreciate it. And here's what happened recently. Recently, I was doing some stand-up, and it was a big night for me because this guy, this big guy from NBC came, and he's the head of NBC, and I don't know his name, and who cares, because they all get canned in like a year anyway. But anyway... <laughs> Oh, God, that's nothing. Wait till I start my pussy chunk. All right. I can make my vulva talk. No. Anyway. All right, so anyway, I'm doing stand-up one night, and this guy from NBC comes, and, you know, I'm, like, trying to get a TV show, trying to get a gig, whatever. I'm always on the bread line. And he... And he brings Kelsey Grammer with him, right? So it's this big night, and I'm trying to do well and all this stuff. And as it turns out, the show went well, and I had a meeting with Kelsey Grammer a couple of days later, and then I had a meeting with the NBC guy. All right, first of all, I go to the Kelsey Grammer meeting, and it's at Paramount, and I'm feeling very kind of full of myself. You know, yes, Miss Griffin for Mr. Grammer, I'm sure he'll see me, all that stuff. And so I go in, and the minute I walk in the meeting, I start getting the flop sweat, right? My butt crack is just a puddle at this point. And <laughs> I'm really nervous, and it's one of those things, you know how like when you start to sweat, you don't know at what point you should acknowledge it? You know, when you're, you're a little bit dewy, you're thinking, oh, it might make me look a little refreshed, and then you get the flop sweat, and then you gotta own it. So anyway, I'm talking to Kelsey Grammer about the millions we're gonna make together, or whatever, and the thing is, it was right, it was like a few days before I was gonna have one of my brow lifts, and, cause I like to have, yes, I like to have a brow lift once, twice a year, um, where they just take my eyebrows and put them on a totally different part of my head. Um, and after that, I look weeks younger. Okay, so, I'm very open about it. All right, um, we'll get to Larry King in a minute. So, uh, <laughs> All right, wait, let me just say this. I saw Larry King, and he was interviewing Pam Anderson. And it was really fun because Pam and Remember when Pam Anderson did her hepatitis tour? Remember when she got hepatitis? And <laughs> she got hepatitis, and then she did a press tour about it because she's very conscious of women's issues. And she went on Larry King, and she's talking about it. Oh, and by the way, she said she got it from Tommy Lee, which of course she did. And Tommy Lee says she got it from a doorknob. And... <laughs> I'm sure that's at least what she got from Tommy Lee. I saw Tommy Lee at an award show two weeks ago. I got crabs from looking at him. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I looked at him and I was like, fuck, Tommy, get out of here. <laughs> get out of here, keep it moving, Tommy. So, so anyway, She's, talk she's talking a minute, and then she had had her boobs reduced. You know, she keeps getting reduced, then bigger and stuff. And then Larry King has the balls to say to her, aren't you afraid of that plastic surgery? <laughs> in the meantime, his ears meet in the back of his head, right? <laughs> but I digress. Okay, so I'm meeting with Kelsey Grammer, and I'm talking to him about some whatever dog and pony show I'm peddling, you know? And then um, I start the flop sweat, and I didn't know if I should own it, right? So then I actually feel like the drip go like, boom, 
like that. So then, oh shit. So now I look like a big weirdo. So I just said, you know, I gotta stop you, Kels. Um, I said, I, I have to own that I'm really having a sweating issue. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. And I go, let me just get a Kleenex in my purse. So I reach in my purse, and of course, as I reach in, my purse turns into like this black hole where the more I dig in and look for something, the deeper it gets, and I can't find it. And someday somebody's gonna become a billionaire by just inventing like a, a purse that's white inside so you can see shit with lights. Like a, <laughs> like a disco floor, you know? But anyway. So I'm reaching in, and of course I can't find Kleenex. The one time I need, I can't find it. But then in the meantime, I, my, like, I, my purse falls over, and what's the first thing that comes out? Of course, tampon. Thank you. <laughs> so, so now I don't know what to say, and I'm like, isn't it great? I haven't gone through the change yet. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm like, I'm trying to. Okay, so. So then, so then the purse spills, and now my Vicodin spills out. Because I'm gonna have the brow lift in a week, and now I'm fucking, you know, Winona Ryder, where my <laughs> prescription drugs are just falling out all over Paramount. You know, as if Kelsey hasn't seen a few of those bottles himself. <laughs> like putting them back in the purse and all this stuff. So anyway, at one point it got so bad that he literally handed me a roll of paper towels. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, needless to say, you know, he didn't, he didn't like want to do a show with me, but I'm sure that call's coming down the pike. So then a few days later, I have my big meeting at NBC, right? So I'm going in and I'm, you know, pitching my show or whatever, and I'm worried about the butt crack sweat. So I decide to think ahead and I go in and I'm trying to look good, right? I've got like jeans and heels and a shirt on and I decide to pack my ass crack <laughs> to be safe. So I've like sprayed, you know, deodorant and stuff and I actually take some Kleenex and I pack it like that. <laughs> I just put it in <laughs> and it was like a panty liner except a panty liner was way too thin. I had to really pack it. <laughs> So anyway, I go in his office, I sit down, I'm regaling him with stories, he's laughing, and I'm thinking, this meeting is going great. All right, so, and I'm thinking it's a good thing I packed my ass crack, everybody's happy, there's no spot there. I leave the office, I walk down outside to my car, I reach in, it's gone. <laughs> to this day, I have no idea. If it's like in a ball on his couch. I don't know if there's a trail of it to the car. All right. I have, I have no couth, I have no fashion sense. Oh, and let me tell you something. I loathe the fashion industry. I hate them, I hate all those fuckers, and here's why. I got this gig one time, and this is such a fucking D-listed gig, you're not gonna believe it. Cause you know, I'm very open about my status as a D-list celebrity, and <laughs> This, oh yeah, when Hollywood Squares calls, I say, what time? So, <laughs> I'm gigging, I'm gigging. Okay, so, so anyway, I get, I get this uh, call to participate in the VH1 Fashion Awards, right? So I said, you know, I'm thinking, you know, am I getting an award? You know, no. Am I presenting? No. Oh, although, they did want, oh, get this, okay. They I'm whispering because this has to be just between us. Um, <laughs> They did want me to present an award to Renee Zellweger for best like red carpet dresses of the year or whatever. And then, and this should have been the first red flag of the job, then they said that Renee Zellweger said she didn't want me to give her the award. <laughs> yeah, celebrities love me. So anyway, so like I got like fired from giving her an award and I say whatever that sweaty puffy cocor wants, she should get. <laughs> cute, but she's like really puffy, right? Like since Sherry McGuire, right? Her eyes are like slits now. What's going on? <laughs> All right, so maybe, maybe a little bit. Okay. Uh, allegedly. <laughs> Shit, I was supposed to say that at the beginning. Oh, everything I say is true, but unless you're going to sue me, and then I'm, I, wait, wait, it's not, oh, shit. Um, don't sue me. I don't fucking have anything. All right, so, um, okay, so, uh, so anyway, everything I say is alleged. So, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying shit that is, uh, I didn't, uh, it's an homage. Okay, so. 
So anyway, they call and they say, we want you to work the red carpet of the VH1 Fashion Awards, kind of like Joan and Melissa. And I said, well, that's like really their thing. I don't really know how to do that and stuff. And they said, no, we're going to make it really comedic. In fact, we're going to set up a booth called Kathy's Happy Place. <laughs> and they literally built this booth for me, meaning if any of the celebrities got pissed off that they thought I was being too, like, mean, then I could just look up at the sign and go, oh, no, Angie Harmon, it's Kathy's Happy Place. What's the problem? <laughs> so, so... I go to New York to do it, and right out the gate, like, they loathe me. Like, I'm the lowest, I'm totally the bitch boy of the VH1 Fashion Awards. First of all, it's run by VH1 and Vogue magazine, and I hate those assholes, you know what I mean? They're telling us all we don't know how to dress and stuff. Um, and Vogue magazine's editor is this big cunt named Anna Wintour. And... I want you to know that I saw the vagina monologues three times, and it turns out we took that word cunt back, and now it's a really good word. Uh, there's a whole section about it. Okay, so anyway, yeah, she's a horrible, horrible person, and she can suck it, and here's why. I have such a list of people in Hollywood who can suck it, they barely have time. All right, so... So anyway, um, they, you know, so Vogue magazine actually has say about like what material I could do and stuff like that. And who knows comedy more than Vogue magazine? So, <laughs> so, okay. So as if that isn't enough of a red flag for me to just pack and go home, now it's time for me to go to the rehearsal. And because I'm me, I have to be there like three days early to rehearse. And all the big stars just show up about an hour before the show. So I'm there and I'm supposed to go over my like little jokes that I'm telling and stuff because I was supposed to work the red carpet. Then at the end of the show, I was supposed to um, sort of do like a red carpet wrap up and do, basically do a little stand up. So I go to the rehearsal and this is this place in New York and it was kind of soon after 9-11 so they had all the metal detectors because if the terrorists are going to target the most important group of people possible, they're gonna go for the VH1 Fashion Awards. And let me tell you something, I'm lighting the fucking wick. All right, so that's terrible. That is inappropriate. I'd be like, Muhammad in 10. Okay, so, oh, I went to Afghanistan last Christmas. I gotta tell you about it, you're gonna shit. Okay, I swear to God, I, me in Afghanistan for a whole week walking around going, where's the Four Seasons? Um, so, okay, so anyway, I go and it's rehearsal day and I'm behind Macy Gray. To, and the, we're in, the, you know, in line for the metal detector. All right, Macy Gray, what exactly is wrong with her? <laughs> I'm not sure. She for sure has a little mental retardation, for sure, a little bit. <laughs> Allegedly. Okay, so... So anyway, she's there, she's got her whole posse, and she's, she's wearing her, as I call it, um, her long coat, or as I call it her, and then there's Maud coat. Remember that show, Maud? <laughs> Remember Maud from the 70s? She is the black B. Arthur, whether she likes it or not. <laughs> So anyway, we're in line for the metal detector, and she's got all kinds of jewelry and rings. And so the minute she walks up, it's just going whoop, 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 whoop. All right, so she, first of all, she's big as a horse, right? And yet, she has the fucked up baby voice, which, is there anything more charming than a grown woman with a baby voice? Mmm, yummy. I'm hard thinking about it. So anyway, so the alarms are going off, and Macy Gray's just going like this. trying to tell her what to do, and finally he's like, ugh, let her in. Like, I don't even care if she has a gun, let her in. <laughs> so, now it's time for the actual show, and they've given me the segment producer woman, who's horrible, and she's sort of like in charge of my red carpet segment, right? And so, um, she's one of these women who I think is in show business, trying to get ahead by acting like the worst part about men. You know what I mean? Like, she's so testosterone-driven and aggressive that no matter what I would say, she's like at DEFCON 5. Like, I wanted to do this one joke about Gwyneth Paltrow, because she had done a nude layout in Bazaar, and is anything sexier than Gwyneth Paltrow nude? Mmm. <laughs> she is oozing sexuality. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> she's classy. She's our new tippy headron. All right, so anyway... <laughs> So I wanted to do this joke about it, saying I had one of the pictures that wasn't published, and I wanted a graphic of a stick figure, and I was going to put her head on it. And so, all right, so harmless. Okay.
Okay, so, so I asked this producer, I said, hey, is there any way you can get me a graphic of a stick figure? And she's like, um, okay, I need you to hear me. I'm putting out fires right now. I know you're not gonna get it, but I can't do that. Be with me. I need you to hear me. Like, Jesus Christ, lady, give me a crayon and a piece of fucking paper. I'll do it myself. <laughs> Always with the drama. Okay, so, so anyway, um, then now it's you know it's getting closer for me to actually go out and do my red carpet bit. And the red carpet is let's say from three to five, and the show's at five. So I'm getting dressed in the fucking bathroom or whatever. And then all of a sudden, this woman runs in and she goes, "You've got to get to the red carpet and start now, now!" And it was really early. And I said, you know, uh, okay, well, is anybody here yet? And she's like, Angie Harmon is here. So I was like, well, let me, well, fuck me then. And I ran as fast as I could. <laughs> So I go up and I'm standing at the end of the red carpet in Kathy's happy place, which was not particularly happy. And, and the, thing that was, the thing that was supposed to be cool about it was they said I didn't have to ask any serious questions. Like, I wasn't going to say, who are you wearing and what's your latest project? I was supposed to ask, like, fun questions. And they actually gave me this pile of boxes of NADS, the hair removal system. <laughs> And so, like, if one of the interviews was going south, I could just give him a box of nads and say, like, you know, good luck. And um, <laughs> by the end of the night, I didn't have a box left. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> then, sure enough, Angie Harmon and her husband, Jason Seahorn, come up to me, and they couldn't have been nicer, right? So I was, like, putting the mic in her face, and I said, Angie, you are, you know, the most beautiful wife of anybody on the New York, what is he, the Jets? <laughs> Giants? With, whatever. All right, so... Some team where all the guys beat their wives. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Kobe is 100% innocent. How dare you? <laughs> all right, you know what I heard about the Kobe case? I heard this from Greta Van Susteren, although she said it was a rumor. Oh shit, I shouldn't have even said that. Her and the whole Scientology posse will fucking have me killed on the way home. <laughs> Scientology, I'm covered in body thetans right now. I'm an alien. What a bunch of fucking freaks. <laughs> Isn't Scientology one of those things where you really like someone and then once you hear they're a Scientologist, you're like, mm, I'm out. You know, it's like, so, well, you don't want to say it because you don't really want to piss them off because they do kill people somewhere in the South. Um, I said, um, you know, you, you, you're the most beautiful wife of anybody on the New York Giants. And I said, do you find all the other wives hate you? And she was really sweet. She laughed and like she knew I was kidding and stuff. And it was great. I gave him a box of nads. I sent him on their way. So, <laughs> so anyway, Donna Karen comes up with her like ripped flag t-shirt or whatever. And I, you know, I'm trying to ask her funny questions. So all I knew about Donna Karen is that she has huge jugs and she's friends with Barbara Streisand. So, and that's all I needed. So anyway, she comes up. <laughs> She comes up and I said, I said, um, Donna, I said, you're, you're a very famous designer, you have very famous friends. I go, I'm just curious, if you and Barbara and I were to spend a day at your home in the Hamptons, what would we do? And she looks at me and she goes, I don't even know you. That was, she was like one of the nice ones. So anyway, so I asked her something else and she was equally like bothered by it. And finally I just go, Donna, you have huge jugs. You could totally be a manager at Hooters, seriously. <laughs> and then, which she could. So, so then, then I see all these other celebrities that just, I actually see them not wanting to talk to me. One of them was Hillary Swank, who I had dinner with one time when she was in the Karate Kid, right? So, yeah, so I'm thinking I know her. So Hillary Swank walks up in her fancy designer outfit, and I'm like, oh! Hillary! Hillary, hi, it's me! All right, this is what I see half the celebrities there doing. It's like this. Okay, you guys are me, and I'm Hillary Swank. <laughs> you guys are me, and I'm Sandra Bullock. of failure and nobody wanted to catch it. So, so anyway, up comes Deborah Gibson, right? Debbie Gibson from the 80s. So anyway, then the segment producer woman starts yelling, Debbie Gibson's coming. We don't want nobodies, right? Like that. I know. And she's like that close. Here's the thing. 
I've been Debbie Gibson so many fucking times. Like, I've been that person. So I know she overheard it. She knows I heard it. It's so uncomfortable. So I'm going, no, no, I want to talk to her. I, she's so funny on Stern. Yeah, 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 bring her up. Okay, so she comes up, and she was really, really sweet. And I'm asking her whatever. I'm giving her neds like there's no tomorrow. And then... <laughs> You know, then the segment producer woman is like this, like, get rid of her, get rid of her, she's nobody. Like, I'm gonna just go like, get out, Debbie! And like, push her. <laughs> so, what am I gonna do? So, all right, so up comes Salma Hayek. All right, yeah. Um, very beautiful, very beautiful and talented. How long has she lived here? Still can't speak English. Okay, so. I said something like, um, I said, Salma, you're such a beautiful, hot, spicy Mexican fox. Do you ever miss doing movies with Antonio or something like, whatever. And then she, no matter what I said, she would go like this. You are crazy. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, your, your dress is really, really great. I love it or whatever. And then she just went, you're crazy. <laughs> All right. Let me just say this. All right, you know after 9-11 when they had that um, telethon, right, with all the celebrities? All right, I call it the celebrity gagathon, and here's why. I think it's great that like Tom Cruise donated a million bucks and Julia Roberts, and that part's all cool. But those guys all wanted a fat fucking medal because they went on the phone for two hours and talked to real people. I saw like Ben Stiller or somebody on Entertainment Tonight saying that the most moving thing about doing that telethon was he goes, yeah, it was amazing. We were on the phone for two hours talking to like people. <laughs> All right, you gotta realize, these celebrities are so pampered, I don't even think most of them knew how to use a phone. <laughs> so most of them are at that tele uh, telethon, like holding a phone, like, hello? <laughs> hello? <laughs> hello? <laughs> it's broken. So, all right, here's the other thing. Now, I don't know if you heard, I think I read this on like Drudge Report, so it probably isn't true, but anyway, I heard that someone in the celebrity telethon could, didn't know how to do the decimal points, so every time somebody would donate $100, they would put it down as 10,000. <laughs> so they had to keep calling these people and saying, did you donate 10,000? And every time the person would go, no, no, I donated 100. You know it was Selma Hayek, you know it! <laughs> So anyway, okay, so now uh, nobody wants to talk to me. Everybody's blowing by. And now uh, I, I hear, uh, I'm talking to, who the hell is I talking? Oh, now it's uh, Destiny's Child shows up, right? So someone comes up to me and they say, oh, oh, you know, it was my husband. My poor husband, Matt, is there on security. Because I'm thinking I could literally just get hit, so I better just have my husband there. <laughs> and let me just say this. <laughs> my husband is so sweet. If you ever met him, like, you wouldn't even believe he's with me. And here's the thing. <laughs> has ever, ever once met my husband and said anything like, um, hey, how'd you get so lucky? <laughs> ever. No one has ever gone up to him and been like, hey, how'd a guy like you get a dish like that? Ever. <laughs> Whenever someone meets my husband, they're like, so, uh, you're Kathy's husband, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and then they, you know, give him the number to a shelter. So, um... <laughs> So anyway, my husband Matt comes up to me and he says, um, hey, I overheard Beyonce saying she's afraid to talk to you because she's afraid you're going to make fun of her. So, and I've met those girls a few times. So I said, tell Beyonce, I'm going to ask her funny questions, but I'm not like gunning for her. So he says, okay. So then they, they say, okay, Beyonce is going to come talk to you, but only if you promise to be nice. And I said, I will be nice. So anyway, she comes, she walks past me and she says, are you going to be nice? I go, Beyonce, I have no issue with you. I go, but know that I'm going to tease you and ask you a comedic question. She goes, okay. So all three girls are there in those hideous outfits their mother makes. <laughs> oh, but I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Okay. But you know what I'm saying, with the studs and the big, the epaulettes and shit. Okay, so anyway. Um, okay, so anyway, the girls are there, and I said, um, I said, I'm here with the wonderful and talented Destiny's Child. I said, girls, I have a question. If you're Destiny's Child, who's Destiny's daddy? <laughs> like a silly question, right? I swear to God, all three of them, and it, it felt 
like forever. I'm sure it was probably like only 15 seconds, but this is what they did. <laughs> and then Beyonce leans in and she goes like this. God. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. Take your nads. So, So then I'm talking to somebody else. I think I was talking to Kenneth Cole, the shoe guy, who's actually very, very nice. So I'm talking to Kenneth Cole, and he's telling me some really moving story about he knew someone at the WTC, and it's like one of those heavy moments, right? And then behind him, I see this segment producer woman going like this, right? Like, what? you, you can't stop someone when they're saying stuff like that. So fi finally, you know, I said, I kind of thanked him for his time. And so he walks away, and I said to this woman, I go, don't do that, all right? You don't know what someone's in the middle of, right? And then she looks at me, and she goes like this. We have Gwyneth! We have Gwyneth! <laughs> With the veins bulging. <laughs> you know, by then, I had been blown off by everybody. I was so in no mood for Paltrow and her big bag of bullshit. <laughs> so, and there she is, and I can totally see her off to the side, literally going like this. So they like browbeat her into coming to talk to me. And she's with Stella McCartney. That's another one, right? <laughs> Remember the bathing suits with the big pineapple covering your peach? <laughs> yeah, she's an artist. So here's the thing. You know where my pussy is. You don't need to draw a picture of a pineapple on it. It's right there where it's always been. Why don't you have an arrow that says party time? All right, so. <laughs> So of course those two are together. So anyway, they finally talked Paltrow into come coming over to me. And let me just say, this is my issue with her. I just feel like she always has this like condescending way about her. You know, like I'll see her on David Letterman, who I love so much, and he'll ask her a question, and he'll clearly be kind of teasing her, and I'll say something like, "So, you know, now you make 20 million a picture. What's that like?" And no matter what he says to her, she's like this. <sighs> Like, what's with the asshole? I hate that. <laughs> and then, when she was doing press for Shallow Hell, she had the balls to say that for her to be in the fat suit and everything, which she bitched and moaned about, by the way, and she was saying that it was empowering to women. Yeah, it's very empowering. That film made a lot of large women feel so much better about themselves. <laughs> and also, she was saying that the film had a good message because it showed, you know, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. You know, like when she went out with big, fat, ugly Brad Pitt or... <laughs> Holy poly Ben Affleck or <laughs> Tuffelard Chris Martin. Okay, so so that's my issue with her. Okay, so anyway, they finally talk her into coming up to me, and I swear to God, she walks up to me like this. All right, you guys are me. She comes up like this. <laughs> you know you've seen that smile. You know you've seen that with the head tilt and the like. <laughs> I've fucking had it. I've been on that fucking red carpet for two hours. I got people that openly hate me. I'm throwing nads left and right. I, and then that bitch Anna Wintour, when she came and talked to me, and I swear to God, she was wearing an outfit with a fucking tail and shit. Like, she looked so freaky. <laughs> you know, I asked her how much she made a year and she left in a huff. So, <laughs> that one. So any, I did, I said that to Anna Wintour. I said, Anna, I understand that you're a tyrant and you rule this magazine with an iron fist. Is that true? And she went, I don't know what you're talking about. And then I said, is it true that you're firing me right now? And then she literally went, oh, oh, and like left in a hug. Bunch of real riots over there at Vogue. Anyway, so there's Paltrow looking down at me with Stella McCartney. And I said, um, Gwyneth, I noticed you're very, very uh, classy and very beautiful, but you're very, very thin. Seriously, when's the last time you ate? So, <laughs> it's what I was wondering. So, so, of course she has to give me the, <sighs> what are you talking about? <laughs> with the eye rolling. So, 
so anyway, I look at Stella McCartney, who's also about 92 pounds, and I said, Stella, you're quite thin as well. When's the last time you ate? And she goes, two years ago. <laughs> You're my favorite, I love you. Cause she was like, finally knew I was kidding, right? So anyway, then, then I said to Paltrow, I said, um, I said, uh, uh, wait, what did I say? I said something, uh, something, do you, do you, why, uh, what the fuck did I say? Matt, what was the second question I asked her? What was it? Oh, right, right, I go, sorry. <laughs> That's Matt, the luckiest man alive. <laughs> oh, oh, How did he score? How did he score this? <laughs> all right, so. All right, so anyway, <laughs> they can cut that in post. So, um, <laughs> all right, so then I turned to Paltrow and I said, I noticed that you and Stella McCartney have arrived together. Now, how long have you girls been seeing each other? <laughs> so, obviously kidding. So then, so then she just goes, <sighs> what do you mean? <laughs> so I turned to Stella McCartney, I go, Stella? And she goes, two years. <laughs> I hate those assholes that have no sense of humor. All right, so, uh, oh God, we have so much to cover. All right, we should, I, got, I just wanna just digress for a second and talk about Eminem, because I really am fascinated by him. And you know, I worked with him one time, I was in that video, The Real Slim Shady. I'm in the beginning part where I play the nurse. I'm actually throughout. But anyway, the weird, okay, let me tell you how I got that job, because every time I do colleges and stuff, all the kids wanna know um, like what Eminem was like. And I'm also really fascinated by white people who wanna be black. I love the Wiggas, I love the Wigga accent. I love the white kids being all black and blackity black and, I mean, Justin Timberlake is Nubian at this point. He's not even... He's not even black anymore. He's like some tribal African. He should have like the big dish in his lip. Um, he is very black. Okay, so... Um, oh, here's how I got the job. This is so weird. So anyway, I was hosting the Billboard Music Awards and I had to come up with an opening bit. And I came up with this opening bit where I um, was gonna pretend like I was having a lover's quarrel with someone, and then really it turns out to be Snoop Dogg, and he would uh, come out and we would make up on stage and have this big makeout scene. And we did do it, and you know. So anyway, sure enough, a few months later, I get this call saying, you know, a job offer to be in an Eminem video, and I thought, well, that's very exciting, and who doesn't want to meet Eminem, right? So I said, okay, what do I do? And they said, well, we need you to lip sync part of the song. So I said, okay, send me the tape, because the job was the next day. So they sent me the tape, and I called them back, and I said, I only got like 20 seconds of the song. And they said, yeah, that's all we could release for security reasons. Like, I'm not gonna be on the corner of Hollywood and Vine, like, hey, bootleg, Eminem, hey, five dollars. So I show up the next day, and I'm all about watching Eminem's every move. So I put on my nurse outfit, and I get all dressed, and I just pull up a folding chair on the set, because I'm not gonna miss a thing. All right, so finally he shows up, and there he is, in all his Eminem glory. First of all, he's, he's like 5'7", he weighs about a buck ten, and remember when he was gonna kick Moby's ass at the Video Music Awards? I would love to see those two ladies have at it, because... <laughs> and what did Moby ever do to anybody besides a little house music and be a vegan? I mean, come leave Moby alone. So, but you know, I love that Eminem can be so badass when he's got all the bodyguards, right? Okay, so he shows up with all his posse, right? He's white, they're all black. He's talking blacker than anybody, right? And there's big giant guys with the football necks, right? So he comes in, and it was so confusing to me because he's like, yeah, yeah, girl, girl, you tripping, all that shit. And I, nothing makes me more uncomfortable than white people who talk black. I just get nervous. I have like, I mean, it's fun on Ricky Lake, but in real life, I just get... <laughs> to do, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk black or maybe I should just talk Puerto Rican, like I don't know <laughs> what I'm supposed to do. And I'm looking around and what's the first thing you do when white people do that? You look at the black people. Are you? Like, yeah, yeah, 
a girl and grabbing his jock and all that shit. And so, so I look at the actual African Americans, and it's just the emperor's new clothes to them, right? So they're just acting normal and stuff, and they're not talking nearly as black as he is, and he's the blackest guy in the room. And I just panicked, so I just started talking with an Irish accent. I swear to God. <laughs> I was just like, top of the morning to you, Marshall. <laughs> no, Marshall, you don't have to be raping your mother today, Marshall. <laughs> Go on and be a good lad then, Marshall. <laughs> so anyway, I, and then these videos are, are co-directed by Dr. Dre, who I thought was very nice and very professional, and he was really nice to me. And I went up to him during the, you know, at one point, and I said, I'm just curious, how did I get this job? And he said, oh, Snoop recommended you. So it turns out I'm totally in the dog pound. <laughs> All right, so first, I gotta tell you about going to Afghanistan. All right, so this girlfriend of mine on JAG, you know that show JAG, the military show that no one's seen and it's on forever? <laughs> I'm just saying, it's a wonderful show. I'm just saying, I don't know one person who watches it, and it's on all like for 50 years. So, <laughs> so anyway, she did a USO tour one time in uh, Seoul, South Korea, and she was saying, you, if you ever can do a USO tour, you should. It's life changing. It's so meaningful, all the stuff. So, you know, I, I said, okay, well, let me know next time you're going. So she calls me last Christmas, and she says, guess what? We're going to the Persian Gulf for Christmas. <laughs> Immediately, I put my hands over my clitoris because I'm sorry. I, I don't want to insult the Muslim culture. It's such a wonderful culture for women. Um, unless you have a clitoris and you're 13 because they're hacking that shit off. So I'm sorry. I meant peaceful farmers. Peaceful farmers. All right. Yeah, if you're a woman, the Muslims are not your friend. All right. So, uh, oh, relax for Christ's sake. All right. So. Did anybody happen to see that Andrea Mitchell report on CNN a few years ago where they showed a clitorectomy and all the women were in the circle around and the girl was 11 and they were cutting her clit off and all the girls were around going, whoa, and all that crazy shit? <laughs> that scared me. I just don't want to go to Cairo. So um, I will like never forget that sound again as long as I live, you know, so they can all suck it. Okay, so. <laughs> So anyway, she says, you know, we're going to Saudi Arabia. And I was nervous about that. You know, number one, I like my clit. Number two, and I use it every day. I honestly, not a day goes by that I don't need it for something. Um, so, so anyway, I, I was nervous about going to Saudi Arabia because of their fucked up culture and the veils and all that shit. And so um, I said, uh, you know, my husband Matt was saying to me, now you realize if we go to Saudi Arabia and we're walking around Riyadh you, and you see like a man hit a woman or anything like that, he goes, you do know you cannot say anything, right? With the religious police and all that stuff. And I said, well, then we're going to die in a Saudi jail because I'm going to fucking kill him. So. Um, <laughs> So it turns out that my girlfriend was wrong, so she calls me up a couple days later and she goes, oh, I was wrong, we're not going to Saudi Arabia, we're going to Afghanistan. And I was like, oh, sweet. So, um, <laughs> cause it is heaven there. All right. So, so, all right, first of all, I gotta tell you this. Like I said, I'm very open about my status as a D-list celebrity. You're not gonna believe who is on my USO tour. All right, first of all, I was the comic, right? So I'm like the Phyllis Diller. Then they had, they, oh yeah, I was, cause you know, when you go perform for the army, they don't want to hear like, don't you hate Gwyneth Paltrow, me too. They want dick jokes and they want them now. So yeah. I turned so hacky so fast. I was like doing fang material. All right, so anyway, it was me, this country singer no one's ever heard of, some wrestler whose name I can't even remember, the army band, which they're wonderful. But you know, the army guys, they want to hear like DMX and Shania Twain and you know, the army, okay. Two cheerleaders from the Jacksonville Jaguars, which to this day, I don't even know if that's a college or a pro team. <laughs> My girlfriend from JAG, who's like the seventh lead on that show, and you know they wanted Catherine Bell. And I just think it's so funny that even in Afghanistan, I'm on the fucking D list. Even there. So anyway, we go on a military plane, which sucked. And then, and then we go and we, you know, we, we, uh, we land in Kuwait, right? All right, let me just say this. The entire country of Kuwait smells like a fart. Now, I'm sorry if that offends you. 
if you have ever been to Kuwait, you know that's true. It's like, who farted? Oh, Kuwait did. <laughs> We go, we go, and, and you know, and it was, it was definitely it was super, super moving because everywhere we went, and we went to Ku uh, Kuwait, Afghanistan, and Uzbekistan, everywhere we went, it was really impressive. I mean, what these, men, what these men and women do is so beyond what I could ever do, and I was so impressed by them, and they just worked their butts off, and especially the women. I mean, I have no proof of, the, I have no proof of this, but my own observation was that the women have to work like 10 times harder in the military. I just thought, I just was, they just knocked me out everywhere we went. So anyway, we start to do the shows, and here's what the show is. It's super, super Bob Hopey, right? So we, we travel with this guy who's the sergeant major of the army, who's the highest listed army guy, and to them, he's Elvis, right? All right, now let me just say, I'm not from a military family. Like, my dad was in World War II, but we're not really like a military family. And, um, you know, it's, all right, I'm not, I'm not saying that they're sexist in the military. I would say they're a little uh, not as evolved um, <laughs> as they will be in a thousand years. But <laughs> no, 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 I mean, it was honestly, it was charming. But like this guy, the Sergeant Major would introduce me like this. He would literally go like this. And uh, we got a little lady coming up here. And uh, I'll tell you what, she, she's a lady who tells jokes, how about that? <laughs> like, he couldn't believe I was a comedian. And he'd be like, I'll, I'll, show you, I'll tell you what, she's funny as a man, I mean it, give her a hand. Like, I mean, it was, there's no harm, no harm at all, but it just, it kind of blew my mind. So anyway, um, then, then uh, what we would do is every, every base or city we went to, we would do what they call hit the ground running. So they would put us in a Jeep and we'd go out in the middle of desert, you know, to some camp in Kuwait and do a meet and greet or whatever. Or they put us on a Black Hawk and we went up and down on the Black Hawks. Oh, and by the way, let me just say this. I had been on a helicopter one other time and I remember feeling kind of nauseated. So, all right, let me just say this. I, um, what can I say about people from the South? I uh, <laughs> love everyone. And I would not like to make a sweeping generalization about one group of people, because that's not my nature. I, I will say that in my own narrow observation, I seem to have noticed that people from the South seem to be proud of their aggressive ignorance. Anybody? All right. First of all, the wrestler would go out and he would do like this rah-rah speech during the show and his opener was, how you doing? I'm from the great country of Texas. You know what I'm saying? All that shit. Okay, so, you know, I, I, and, you know, I don't want to hear the phrase, I'll tell you what, one more time. They have to start with, I'll tell you what. So, um, I'll tell you what, little lady. So uh, anyway, I did make a couple faux pas, and I admit it, this was me not reading the room. Uh, one time we were in this Jeep, and I was with my friend from JAG, who, by the way, turned Southern on the plane. <laughs> because most of the people in the Army are from the South, and so she got on the plane talking like this, and she got off the plane talking like this. <laughs> which was very smart. So one time, we're in the Jeep, and everywhere you go, they have the M M16s or M M80s. I forgot what they are. M16s? <laughs> M16, right? Okay. So anyway, they, and they're so proficient with these firearms that stupidly, I thought that the army, most of the army guys would be for gun control. My theory being, oh, you, you guys probably realize that only people who know how to use weapons should own them. So like an idiot, I say that. I thought they were going to drop me off in a fucking pup tent and shoot me. <laughs> I mean, it was scary. They're like, what? I'm like, nothing. I don't <laughs> and so, and so then my, my girlfriend from Jack goes, well, it is in the Constitution. And all I'm saying is, you cannot just give me something and take it away. Which I thought was not a great argument, right? And so then, by, under my breath, I hear my husband, Matt, go, yeah, well, we used to be able to own slaves, too. <laughs> and I swear to God, they were like, and I know, and that wasn't, I mean, like, I just felt like, the Southerners were a little scary. All right, so anyway, then, then they would give us these helicopter rides, and every time we'd get on, the drivers would say like, now do you want a ride, or do you want a ride? <laughs> on a helicopter, I'd be like, I want the ride. The first one, the boring one, the ride. <laughs> I don't want the ride, I want the ride. So, it was always one of those fucking country bumpkins going, I want a ride. So, and let me just say, they were always the first ones to puke in their helmet, every time. 
so we go up, and I swear to God, the wrestler was there with his wife, and I actually heard her say, can this thing do a loop-de-loop? <laughs> Be with me. So, so anyway, now it's time to do the show, and we would do the shows, and the thing that was really touching about it was every base we went to, they had lost soldiers. And so you look out, and sometimes we would do a show for 1,500 people and sometimes for, you know, 30 people. And it was so moving because you look out in the audience, and these men and women, they just, they look like kids. You know, their cheeks are pink, and they would say, you know, let's bow our heads for, you know, the person we lost today or whatever, and it was like heartbreaking. And then the show would start, and they'd be cheering. And it was so awesome, you know? So so anyway, the show starts, and it's the army band, and it's all those like America rah-rah songs, you know, that whole, I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free, and they eat that shit up, right? <laughs> and they should, that's their job, and I'm all for it, and I fucking cried every time, don't get me wrong, I cried every fucking night. So anyway, <laughs> then, I know, and then I would go up, and I would do my little dog and pony show, and I'd like make fun of the soldiers, and they would laugh, and they were just, they were really sweet. So anyway, then, oh, wait, I gotta tell you about the cheerleaders. All right, so there were two cheerleaders, and their job was to basically go out in skimpy outfits and like say hi to the guys and some of the ladies, if you know what I'm saying. Um, oh, wait. Let's be honest. All right, so, no, one thing I was fascinated by was, you know, we've all heard so much about gays in the military, and I was determined to see how that really shook down because, if 10% of the population is gay, how can there be, you know, none in the military? So I was looking around, looking for my gays, and then, because um, <laughs> I thought, you know, I'm gonna see them. And so anyway, sure enough, I will never forget it. I'm at a mess hall in Kandahar, Afghanistan, right? Sitting there, because if we weren't doing a show, they would just say, go to the mess hall and make everybody laugh. So I would go and sit down, and I'd ask them where they're from, and that part was always really fun. So I'm sitting there talking to these guys, and then off in the corner, there's this guy holding a tray, and this is all I hear. <gasps> I knew the minute I heard the gay inhale. What are you doing here? <laughs> it was heaven. I was like, I found my gay, even in Kandahar, Afghanistan. <laughs> he plops down next to me, puts the tray down, puts his gun down. He's like, oh, girl, I'm on graveyard tonight. I am a wreck. I'm exhausted. My roommates are all snoring. Ugh, they're pigs. Anyway, what's going on with Ben and J-Lo? It was... <laughs> show, right? So the shows are really fun because the two cheerleaders had come and one of them during the trip decides she's a singer and they're just cute and they would go out there. Yeah. So she brings the karaoke track of the Mariah Carey song Hero. <laughs> it's going to be good. So anyway, she goes out and here's the best part. She's a terrible singer. Terrible because I heard in rehearsal. But the good part is, the guys were all so excited to see her in the skimpy outfit, you could never hear her. So it was like this. I'm gonna start to sing, and you guys be all like hooting and hollering like I'm really sexy. Okay, you ready? Go. Cause there's a hero. Show, we would do these long meet and greets, right? And we had these little pictures of ourselves and we would sign them and I would sign them to guys, wives or sisters or them or whatever. Although they went on for hours and it was so touching because it was, it was Christmas time so it was freezing cold and they'd line up for two hours just for some dumb signed picture of me or the country singer or whatever. And, and it, was so, it was so touching. In fact, after a while I'd get kind of bored, right? So I'm thinking, these are guys in the army. So I'd go, you know, like, two private so-and-so, Kathy Griffin. And I'd go, here, think about this later when you beat off. And then, <laughs> you know, mix it up. And, and, and finally, one of the Marines comes over and he's like, uh, 
Uh, Ms. Griffin, um, maybe, you know, you shouldn't do that. I mean, a lot of these guys haven't seen a woman in six months. And I'd be like, well, then I must look pretty good. So, and every time I did it to one of the guys, you'd be like, huh? <laughs> All right, so anyway, the, so we're, we're at Bagram, and the special ops guys, you could see because most of them had facial hair, because the like CIA guys and stuff, what they do is, you know, they move there, or, I mean, they go there and they learn the language, which is so impressive, because they have like five languages there and all that stuff, and they assimilate into society and they try to get information. So they're bearded and all that stuff. So we've seen these special ops guys throughout the trip. I don't know why the cheerleaders hadn't noticed, but sure enough, what, we're doing this autograph signing thing, and I don't know if it was late or whatever, but one of the cheerleaders, all of a sudden she's signing, and she looks up, and she sees one of our special ops guys with just lay clothes, regular clothes and a beard, and she goes like this. <laughs> and she calls a Marine over, right? And she's really scared, and I'm next to her, and I'm like, what's going on, right? And then she goes, someone from the Taliban got in. <laughs> Someone from the Taliban got in. Let's break it down. The thing I love so much about that is, number one, that the Taliban can just walk onto a U.S. Army base. But that the conversation that day would have been, Ahmed, you know, we really should beat up, uh, we should blow up American base tonight, but I don't know, I would also like an uh, autograph from Jacksonville Jaguar Chile. Uh, <laughs> come on, let's go, I'm not going to lie. It's a priority, still, for, to this day, for the Taliban to get the Jacksonville Jaguar cheerleader calendar. <laughs> All right, so I loved that. All right, so now, during the show, the wrestler would do this spiel, right? And this guy was such a dumbass. He goes up there, and keep in mind, we're in Afghanistan, right? And this is before we captured Hussein, right? So it's before that. So we'd go up on stage, and he's doing like this rah-rah, I love America speech. And he would go up there, and he'd say, I'll tell you what I want you boys to do. Keep in mind, we're in Afghanistan. I want you to go to your capital here. I want you to get Saddam Hussein's wife and pull her burqa off and fuck her up the ass. <laughs> so the audience is like, <gasps> <laughs> and those audiences, what they do in the army is their big thing is hua, right? They yell hua, and they would like do hua at just about anything, right? So they're like, who? <laughs> So, he comes off stage. I can't remember his name. Let's say it was like Crusher, right? So he comes off stage and I'm like, uh, Crusher, uh, good job. Um, I just wanted to tell you, you know, FYI, I said, um, you know, we're in Afghanistan and Saddam Hussein is in Iraq. You know, totally different country. Do doesn't even share a border. So I'm just saying. You know, the president here is Karzai. Remember the guy we keep hearing about? So he's like, all right, little lady. So he goes up the next night and he goes, I'll tell you what I want you boys to do. I want you to go over there to Iraq, which is not even the same country as this one. I want you to get Saddam Hussein's wife, get her burqa, lift it up, and fuck her up. Yes! <laughs> so now they're like, whoo They're like thinking about it. So he comes off stage that night and I'm like, Good job. Um, <laughs> but you know, just something to think about. I go, first of all, in, I, I said, uh, in uh, Iraq, they don't, uh, you know, they don't wear the burqa. They wear like the abaya or whatever. I go, but they don't wear like the full burqa. And I said, secondly, here's the bottom line. If you're Saddam Hussein's wife, you're probably already getting fucked in the ass, you know what I mean? <laughs> so he goes out the next night and he goes, I'll tell you what I want you boys to do. I want you to go over there to Iraq, which is not even the same country as this one, and I want you to get Saddam Hussein and pull his suit pants down and fuck him up the ass. <laughs> Woo! They loved it. <laughs> so, all right. So there's only one time in Afghanistan that it got like a little 
gamey, right? Because my friends are saying, was it ever dangerous? It was never dangerous. We were always surrounded, surrounded by the military. It was never hairy in any way. So one time, though, they decided to take us off the base, and they take us to the outskirts of Kabul, right, the capital. So we go where our guys, and it's just us, <laughs> all right, Coalition of the Willing, it's us and, you know, two Norwegians. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, I did. I saw, like, these four Romanians one time, and they literally, like, sit around and smoke all day. So anyway, uh, it's us. So they go to where we're training the Afghan National Army, which is a great idea. I'm not 100% optimistic now that I've met the entire army. Um, <laughs> but you know, the deal is Afghanistan is tribal, right? So they have like the, the Tajiks and the Uzbeks and the Hazara and the Pashtuns and all that, and they all hate each other. So we're trying to make this like United Colors of Benetton army <laughs> so they can just defend themselves and we can get out of there. But anyway, so our guys are training them and stuff, although they, they don't even have like basic hygiene. Like part of basic training is teaching them not to take a shit in their own homes. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, peaceful farmers. All right, so, oh, and by the way, and this is my own, and I mean, I was there, and you weren't, so, <laughs> probably. Anyway, the women are still totally in the burqas there. I mean, there are parts of Kabul that are like quasi-liberated, but yeah, it's great for the women. Still in the burqas, and the women still can't leave their homes without a man, or else the cleric with a big stick beats them until they go back in. Isn't that great? <laughs> peaceful farmers! All right. They go back in, they clean the bucket of clits. All right, so, uh, oh, Kathy, that was just the limit. You have crossed the line after you moved it. I'm sorry, I'm trying to do your inner monologue for you. So, um, so you know, basically it fucking sucks there and it's a complete shithole. All right, so, uh, so anyway, uh, so anyway, we go and we meet the Afghan National Army and all that stuff. So this is the first time that I've been around civilians. So we get out of the chopper, and all I know is what I've seen on CNN, right? To me, Afghan Afghans are all just, you know, a bunch of big wife beaters. That's all I see, right? The poor women and the sweating and those bur oh, it's horrible. So I get out, and I see the guys, and it, sure enough, it was so crazy, and there were no women around because they can't come outside because they are dirty horse. All right, so anyway, <laughs> so... So anyway, I see all these guys, and it's just the way they are on TV. You know, they got those hats with like that roll, and they got like the robes and all that stuff. It's freaky. I'm telling you, I'm walking around Kabul going, what the fuck am I doing here? So, um, so anyway, I, I see them, and uh, the whole group is together, and they said, you know, make sure you stay together, and we had the soldiers around us, and we were 100% safe and everything. And then I look at this one guy, and he's sitting on a curb. He's like kind of squatting down, and he goes like that, and he covers his, his face because me and the other women weren't veiled. All right, that's all I fucking need. <laughs> I don't know what came over me. I became a strong black woman. <laughs> I walked up to him, and I swear to God, and I went right in his face, and I go, look at my face. Look at it. I'm an American. Like, I got all super freaky and psycho. And then he looks at me like, what the fuck is getting away from? Like, he was super freaked out, right? So then I go up to this other guy who's just a civilian guy, like, minding his business. And I go, like, I go to him, I go like this. Burka, no! <laughs> like, he's one of my dogs. Burka, bad. Sit down. So, so finally this Marine comes up and he's like, oh, Miss Griffin, we would appreciate it if you would not do that. You know, so I'm like, oh, yeah, well, nobody stop. Like, I don't know, I was like a lunatic. So anyway, then I go, and then all of a sudden, these local guys start waving at all of us, and they're going like this. They're going like this, picture, 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 like that. And they're saying, hello, hello, America number one, number one. Like, they've learned a few words. And then they started saying, after lunch, which I don't know where they learned that, but they're like, number one, after lunch. So they start waving, and they desperately want to be in pictures with us. I don't know why, but all of a sudden, I'm thinking like, oh, these guys aren't so bad, because I'm like the type of asshole where if you're nice to me once, I'm your friend for life. So I'm like, sure, you hacked your kid's clit off, but you were nice. So anyway, <laughs> allegedly, that is... Okay, so, so anyway, I start taking pictures with them, all this stuff. So then after a little while, I get a little comfortable. You know, we've been there about two hours and stuff. And then I see this, this group of guys, local guys, and they're on sort of this little hill behind a fence. And they're looking at me and they're saying, come, come, picture, picture, like that. So I was like, all right. So I'm there with Matt with the camcorder. And so I go, and now, like, nobody's really around. So I go and I stand with them, and I'm in this, you know, sort of, group of, of Afghan men, and I'm standing there and kind of posing for a picture, and then all of a sudden, I start to feel them pushing me. I know. So I'm standing there, and I'm like, hey, what, what's going, why does the, 
And then I see Matt with the camcorder go like this. <laughs> Which is not good, right? So, I'm in an Afghan mosh pit. Okay, so, so all of a sudden I'm getting pushed and I'm getting a little freaked out. I'm kind of down like that. I'm feeling sort of the pressure. And then like an angel from heaven, this soldier like reaches in, grabs me by the collar. He yells at them in their native tongue. And I'm like, what happened, what happened? And he said, no, they just got like a little excited. They want a picture. And I told them that if they line up, they can all meet you and have a picture with you. Because they're all very big Salt Lake Susan fans. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> yes, they love the camping episode. All right, so anyway. <laughs> So anyway, I, I thought, okay, well, this is cool. Yeah, if they want to meet me, they can line up properly and all this stuff. So now I said, okay, I'll meet them. I go, but you know what? They have to shake my hand. And I'm going down the line, I'm shaking their hand, I'm going like this. Yeah, that's right, look at me. I'm an American woman. You can shake my hand, motherfucker. That's right, yeah. That's how we roll, yeah. Uh-huh. Hi, poor face, hi. So I'm making my big statement, right, for my country. So then, the soldier's there with me, and I look at this one guy's hand, and it's all stained. So I turn to the soldier, and I go, that last guy, it almost looked like he had shit on his hands. <laughs> and then he said, because it was. <laughs> they wipe with their right hand. I shook shit hands for my country. <laughs> Is anyone in the mood to hear about Brooke Shields' wedding? <laughs> All right. I love this story. She hates it. You'll love it too. Here's why. <laughs> First of all, I love Brooke Shields. I really, you know, I love her and she's so, we're so different. She's so like girly and Crabtree and Evelyn and you know what I mean? And I'm just so, you know, you know, pussy jokes. Okay, so. <laughs> So anyway, I get invited to her wedding, and she actually married this guy, Chris, who, oddly enough, I knew him before I knew her and stuff. So it was really great, and he's a great guy, and they're a great couple and all this stuff. So we get invited to the wedding, and it is like the full-on in-style wedding. It's at this giant mansion in Palm, uh, Palm Beach, Florida, right? And it's owned by this woman, Terry, and I can't remember her last name, so I just called her Terry Big House, because it's this huge mansion right on the water. It's been, they have, you go in the house and they have the leather-bound architectural digest that they're in, right? One of those. And, uh, oh, and she's a riot, too, the woman who owns the house. She's old and she's all leathery, you know, like she's one of those Florida chicks whose, you know, face looks like an old coach bag. And, <laughs> And she's really, really thin and emaciated, and she's always got the tumbler and the ciggy right here, and she's got the whiskey voice like that. And she's really thin, and she always wears like a wrap dress where her boobs kind of hanging out a little bit. You know she's like trying to bang the pool boy. Javier, slower! So, I mean, I don't know. I'm only imagining. So anyway, so she's one of those. And then she's got the little dog, right? The rich people always have to have the little shih tzu or whatever. And the dog's name is Bongo, so she was constantly yelling at Bongo. She's like, welcome to my home, Bongo bad boy! Bongo sent. So, so she was like a character, right? And so, so she's the one, she loaned the house and stuff. So, the, and uh, Martha Stewart did the flowers, you know, rest her soul. And so, uh, <laughs> I love Martha now. I never was into her, and now I like think she's an American hero. I don't know what it is. Although, you know what cracks me up? Did you guys ever, is she, is she Target or Kmart? Kmart, okay. Did you guys ever see that commercial Martha Stewart does for Kmart for the white sale? And you know she's got the super like Connecticut accent where you can't really understand her sometimes? And I swear there's one where she cannot say the word white. She keeps saying, come, come to Kmart for the wheat sale. <laughs> and it gets, the word sounds more like wheat as the commercial goes on. And I imagine that the director is trying to say, like, you're not really saying the word white, it's a white sale. So by the end of the commercial, she's like, yeah, it's still coming for the wheat sale. <laughs> it's just a wheat sale, and that's all there is to it. So I love her. So anyway, she did the flowers, and Brooke had this beautiful Vera Wang gown, and it was just gorgeous, and she looked gorgeous and all that stuff. So here's the deal. <laughs> Brooke's mom was like on some kind of Elkie probation. Now, you know the deal with Brooke's mom, Terry, right? She's like a notorious alcoholic. And I love Brooke's mom. That's the problem. I get along with her great because I love Elkies. Because, like, <laughs> I'm 100% I'm Irish. You know, I'm used to it. So, 
So she, you know, and you know, like many Elkies, the mom is very smart. She's very charismatic. She's very quick. She has a really vicious wit, which of course I love. So I get along great with the mom. So I think the deal, I'm not sure, but I think the mom had to have like 30 days before she was allowed to come to the wedding. And believe me, she fucking white knuckled it. So um, <laughs> it was great. So anyway, so, uh, so she show, so the mom is there, and um, then you know the, the pre-wedding like reception is happening, and it's it's on the, this bluff overlooking the water, and it's beautiful and all that stuff, and then the wedding goes off without a hitch. It's all wonderful, and now it's time for the reception. Okay, so right out the gate, I knew the mom was in trouble because you know how when somebody passes the tray of champagne, it's always the alky that's going like this. Not for me. I'm not having any. <laughs> So you know, she's like, mm. so. And I remember seeing, I remember seeing um, Brooke on this old, like a rerun of a Barbara Walters interview from the 70s or 80s, I can't remember which. But, oh, I had a whole fight with Barbara Walters. I gotta tell you about it, you're gonna shit. Okay, so anyway, yeah. Grandma and I threw down. So, so anyway. Okay, so I remember seeing that Lifetime was rerunning these Barbara Walters interviews. And I remember seeing one with Brooke where she was probably about 15, and she's there and she's so sweet and she's so, you know, beautiful. And she's there with the mom talking to Barbara about how, you know, the mom stopped drinking. And I said to my mom one day, if you keep drinking, I just can't live with you anymore. And Brooke's mom is like, mm-hmm. And the whole time she looks like she like wishes she had a little flask. Like <laughs> So um you know, so, so they've been very public about this struggle and all that stuff. So, but, you know, like I said, the mom is also like a riot. I totally like her. So anyway, now it's time for the reception and it's time for the toasts, all right? So the toasts were great. They had like Gary Shandling gave a toast and he was really funny and Kevin Nealon was hilarious and I got to give a toast. All right, but the deal was, of course, the mom was absolutely not to give a toast, right? Because she's a fucking live wire. So then... <laughs> You know, Brooke and Chris are at the back table and everything's going beautifully, which is a little boring. So then, <laughs> the mom kicks it into high gear. <laughs> all right. So all of a sudden, Terry Bighouse, like, stumbles up to the microphone for a toast. And she's got the tumbler and the ciggy and bongo somewhere following her. <laughs> and then, and she's got Brooke's mom, Terry. And so everybody's kind of looking around. I mean, everybody knows the deal, right? So everyone's like, huh, this will probably be quick. And I... <laughs> I turn my chair around and I'm like, I hope this takes forever. So, um, <laughs> that's some good shit. All right, so, so anyway, then Terry Bighouse is up there and she's going, the two Terrys want to make a toast. You kids are so beautiful. <laughs> so I don't even know what the fuck they were saying. So anyway, it looks like Terry Bighouse is the only one who's going to make a toast. So we're like, shoot. Then Terry Shields starts talking, right? And everyone's kind of looking around, and then Brooke's mom says, this is the first thing she says in the toast. You know, I wasn't even invited to this wedding. <laughs> Who's died and gone to heaven? Me. <laughs> so, no, but... I know, I know I'm a bad person. I'm owning it. I know I'm going to hell in a handbasket. I get it. All right, so... So anyway, everyone's like, oh, shit, you know? And then, so then, then she looks at uh, Brooke's dad with his newer wife, and she's like, so, now you're with my ex-husband. Well, congratulations, you can have him. <laughs> it was fucking on. Okay, so, <laughs> so then, so then Terry Bighouse, as drunk as she is, allegedly, then she starts, she's got the thing, and she's going, Terry, now you stop it. Now we, you be nice. We talked about this. Bongo, bad boy. Bongo, sit. Bongo. Bongo. So then, so then, so then Brooke's mom totally turns it around and then she gets really maudlin and she's like, but I'm just so happy to have my beautiful daughter be happy today because of her. Which in a way is almost worse, right? So then Brooke stands up and she goes, okay, mom, thanks. Like that, like trying to get her off, right? And then the mom's like, what'd she say? So it like makes it worse. So Brooke's going, thanks mom, that was good. So then the mom kind of rambles on for a while and then she sits down. And now we've all resigned ourselves to the fact the mom's half in the bag and I'm just basically following her at this point. And so, <laughs> all right, so now, then, then Brooke hires the singing team. And like I said, she's very Crabtree and Evelyn. And they're called, I don't know if you've heard of them, they're called Tuck and Patty. And yes, and they're a folk duo. And I'm, I mean, 
I, they just cracked me up because Patty is a very large African-American woman and uh, Tuck is a very skinny white guy who kind of looks like Tiny Tim. So, <laughs> so they're singing all kinds of songs and they're singing like these folk songs, one of which was called The Earth is Our Mother, We Shall Not Bury Her. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right, so anyway. When I go to a wedding, I live for the wedding cake. It's all I care about. So Brooke at one point calls me, she's like, come on, we're gonna get started. So I'm like, oh, sweet. So I go and sit in the very front row as close to the wedding cake as possible because I literally want the second piece. And so I love it. So anyway, I sit down and I'm right in the front row with Brooke and it turns out she meant come sit here because Tuck and Patty are starting their like full concert. So I'm like, oh shit. And I'm looking at the cake salivating like a dog and so, so anyway, Tuck and Patty start singing The Earth is Our Mother, and then they, and then Patty decides to kick it into high gear and start scatting in the middle of it. So, yeah, so the song's like this. The earth is our mother. We cannot bury her. The earth is our mother. Like that. All right, I'm not gonna lie. I start laughing my ass off. I can't help it. I can't help it. of laugh where you're afraid to even breathe. <laughs> like you're just trying to suppress it so hard. And I swear to God, I'm thinking, God in heaven, please do not let Brooke turn to her right. Please do not. I know I was barely invited as it is. Do not let her. So I look over at Brooke and I swear to God, she's so moved by the song, she has a tear coming down her eye. In the middle of my hysterical, inappropriate laughing fit. So of course, this is what I see. joke. I, it's not, it's not, I'm not, the earth is our mother. I'm totally loving it. So, so I knew I was on the shit list. So anyway, then, then Tuck and Patty finish and now it's time to start like the disco portion, right? So, all right, get ready. So Brooke's mom walks toward me and she's for sure in the bag at this point. And she's doing like, she's walking toward, but she's kind of doing this like when somebody wants to dance with you and they're like, hey, who wants to dance? And so, I remember thinking, you know, I could be injured. So, <laughs> so anyway, she comes up and I decided to do this thing where I acted like I didn't know she wanted to dance, but I was acting like she wanted to high five me. Cause she's going like this and I'm like, yeah, sister. So I got a high five her. She must've been a little perturbed by that. So I swear to God, she reaches under and grabs my piece and like squeezes it and walks away. <laughs> I run over to Brooke. I go, your mother just molested me. I could sue you and own this house. So, <laughs> allegedly. So, so Brooke's just like, I know, I know. And then I swear to God, she said the ill-fated words. She goes, you have to put this in your act. And I was like, what? I would never. So, <laughs> cause it's a private time. All right, so anyway. Then all of a sudden I'm sitting there with Matt and the mom comes and stands next to Matt and some disco song comes on and I swear to God, I'll never forget this. She turns, she goes, oh, I love this song. She turns to my husband, Matt, grabs the back of his hair and like lays one on him. And I turn, it was the weirdest moment where I was there and I was like, hey honey, we should, Brooke Shields' mom is tongue kissing you? Like it was, <laughs> and she pulls away and then she leaves, like it's nothing to her. And Matt looks at me like, you know, he's soiled and, <laughs> He needs counseling and he's kind of shaky and he's like, I didn't, I'm like, I know, I know. He's going to a safe place. And so then, so then, then there's this great moment where, you know, when rich people have these events, I've noticed whenever I've been to like super fancy person's house, they love to cordon off most of the house, right? Cause you know, the common people are to hang out like in the kitchen and one powder room. And I was dying for a tour of the house. Cause I love houses. I love open houses. If I ever come to your open house, hide your journal. Cause I'm going to read it. So I love it. Okay. So anyway, uh, I'm not leaving until I see a picture. All right, so anyway, uh, I go and I see uh, Brooke's mom and she's like, how you doing, kid? And I said, oh, I'm doing great. I said, boy, I'd love to get a tour of this house because it's so beautiful, without thinking. And so anyway, so she, she kind of hooks my arm and she walks by and then the groom's mother, trying to help me out, says, can I help you ladies with anything? And then Brooke's mom, and this is why I love her, 
without missing a beat, says to the groom's mother, shut up, you fucking cunt. <laughs> It was, shut up, you fucking cunt. I mean... It was a fucking dream come true. All right, so um, I want to... All right, wait, what should I do this? Oh. Oh, good luck. All right, so get this. You guys, I'm not kidding. You guys are such a dream. I'm like, I just appreciate you so much. Okay, so anyway. Here's the Barbara Walters deal. Okay, so I've been on The View a whole bunch of times, right? And I, you know, those girls, I know them a little bit, but not very well, and they're all very, very nice. Now, this happened when Lisa Ling was still on the show before she ruined her career and decided to do important work. All right, so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so anyway, I had been on The View a bunch of times, but never when Barbara Walters was there. And granted, she's an icon, and I admire her, and she's definitely a trailblazer, but one thing that bothers me is she doesn't seem to ask the question. You know, she gets the great interviews, and, you know, she gets Angelina Jolie, who's super crazy, and, you know, I have a lot of questions for Angelina Jolie. <laughs> a lot. So anyway, you know, that's the only thing is Barbara Walters is, you know, she's very soft with the interviews, and that kind of bothers me. But anyway, she's, she's great and all this stuff. So, um... I, I notice when I've done that show, it's very fun and loose, but I've never been on, there on Barber Day. So I go, and the minute I walk into the ABC building, I can tell everything's different. There's a lot of panicky gay PAs talking their earpieces. No, Barbara wants the brooch. No, the one that goes with the Chanel suit. I'm putting out fires. So everybody's very tense. I don't know what the fuck Barbara does to these poor people, but they are scared shitless of her. As are all the other women on the panel. So I go and I don't even like try to talk to her or anything. Although let me just say this, I love doing The View and I know that I won't do it anymore, but <laughs> up until this, I loved it. And one thing was you meet the weirdest people on that show. Like one time I was walking down the hall at The View and I saw uh, Nancy Sinatra, right? These boots are made for walking. First of all, she's had more face work than me and Michael Douglas put together. Secondly, <laughs> oh, we'll get to him in a second. Anyway. <laughs> So anyway, she's got the crazy boots, right? And she looks at me in the hall, and I, I mean, I never think anybody's gonna know me, right? So she looks at me, she sees me in the hall, and I didn't even wanna bother her, and she stops me and she goes, you're a funny dame. And keeps walking, I love shit like that. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> so anyway, um, I see Lisa Ling in the hallway, and when I was uh, just engaged to Matt, she and I uh, uh, had lunch together with Matt and her then boyfriend. So I said to her, I go, hey, remember the guy we had lunch with that one time? Well, guess what? You know, I'm getting married to him now. And she said, oh, that's great. He seems so nice and all this stuff. And I said, she goes, would well, you want to talk about it? I said, no. I go, don't ask me about it on the show because we're going to do some kind of a weird charity tie-in where we have people donate to a charity instead of giving us presents. But I said, I don't know anything about it yet. So, you know, don't ask me about it on the show. So she's like, okay. So anyway, now it's time for me to go on the show. And by the way, this is how D-listy my life is. This is what I was on the view to promote. Typical. I was co-hosting the Greenwich Village Halloween Parade for the Sci-Fi Channel. <laughs> oh yeah. Only the best. Yeah. Call Griffin. So, um, apparently the animal planet couldn't meet my quote. So, um, so anyway, that's what I'm there to plug, right? So I go on, and the first thing I notice is Barbara isn't even looking at me, right? So I'm talking to the girls, and they're all being very nice, and Barbara's just kind of down looking at her information card. Like, so like, you will so never be on that post-Oscar special, I'm not even gonna bother, right? But I was kind of fascinated by her, you know? So anyway, the girls and I are chatting about the Halloween special and this and the other, and then out of the blue, I hear Barbara all of a sudden perk up and say, so I understand you're engaged. And I was like, oh shit, you know, like I didn't really like have anything prepared to talk about that and all that stuff. So I said, well, I said, yes, and my fiance and I are going to have some sort of a charity tie-in where we will have people donate to a charity in lieu of giving us gifts. But I said, I haven't worked out anything yet, so I hope to come back in a year. I hope you ladies will have me back, and I hope, I can, I hope to have a wonderful success story for you. So then she goes, a charity wedding? Oh dear, that's what Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones are doing. 
totally stealing my thunder, right? So I'm like, oh, for Christ's sake, I'm here talking about the fucking Halloween parade. Now I got to go up against Michael Douglas, who has more money than God, his child bride, and their fake wedding. So... <laughs> money for this charity. I'm not, I can never raise that much money. You know, I'm not Michael Douglas. And, and by the way, let me just say this. I read in Liz Smith that when Michael Douglas married Catherine Zeta-Jones, what they did was they have their, you know, their child, right? That was, they already had the kid before they got married. And they had people make a check out to the baby. And that when the baby grows up, he'll decide what charitable donations to make with the money when he's 21. All right, that's bullshit. All right. <laughs> is bullshit because the charity that we ended up picking was AMFAR, right? The American Federation for AIDS Research. We had people make the checks directly to AMFAR. There was no like Kathy and Matt fund or any bullshit like that. <laughs> they just made the checks right to AMFAR. Although let me just say this. I made everybody mail the checks to me personally so I could see how much they were. <laughs> Vicious. I was literally calling my own friends going, you gotta be fucking kidding me with that 25 bucks. <laughs> All right, you can come to the wedding, but you're not eating. A <laughs> hundred thanks. So, I mean, I'm just trying to raise as much as possible, right? So anyway, then, and I didn't know that at the time, but I'm thinking, oh, for Christ's sake, you know, Barbara's gonna fucking throw down with me now about the charity wedding. So then, you know, and so I just turned to her and I said, well, I go, our, Barbara, our wedding is a little different because ours isn't shotgun. So... <laughs> reaction was exactly that. Exactly. <laughs> and let me tell you something, that's a live show, and it was like palpable in the audience. I mean, there was tension, right? So anyway, Barbara Walters does this thing that I've noticed powerful people do when you call them on something and they can't believe it. So she's got her card, and she does what I call retracto head, <laughs> which is I say, well, ours isn't shotgun, and she just goes like this. fall off and roll down 59th. So, so anyway, everybody can feel it, right? I look at the other girls on the panel and they're just like, oh. I'm making Barbara mad. Stop it. So, so I go, you know, ours isn't shotgun. And Barbara Walters goes like this, really snotty. She goes, well, this isn't either. Like that, with that cadence, like very like, you know, um, I know you are, but what am I? Or, you know, I thought she was gonna say, you're not the boss of me. So I was like, I couldn't believe it. I'm sitting there on The View, trying to get people to turn on the sci-fi channel for the Halloween parade, and Barbara's throwing down with me. I'm like, bring it, bitch! <laughs> So anyway, finally I said, well, Barbara, you're in bed with all those famous people I'll never meet. What do I care? And then she goes, well, you certainly won't. <laughs> and then Lisa Lane cuts in and she goes, so uh, if you live here in New York, then you can go see Kathy Griffin tonight at the Greenwich Village Parade. It's going to be so much fun. I'll be there. And I swear to God, out of frame, you hear Barbara Walters go, well, I won't be there. <laughs> So now, it goes to commercial. It goes to the commercial break, so my segment is over, and I'm sitting on the couch for a second, and I thought, here's the thing. I'm a really paranoid person. Like, I think people are trying to kill me every day. So I'm sitting there, and I thought, you know what, Kathy? You probably really exaggerated this in your mind. Barbara Walters is a very powerful woman. She's, you know, it's not about you. So I decided to test the waters a little, because I'm always thinking. Yeah. So anyway, Barbara Walters is standing over there with Meredith Vieira. So I turn and kind of like in their direction, I said, thanks for having me, ladies. It was really fun. So Meredith says, thanks, Kathy. It was great to see you. And then Barbara Walters just doesn't look up from her card. She's like this. All right. So I leave. Even still, I'm thinking, you know what? I probably made that all up. I'm sure it was fine. Two months later, I'm doing Hollywood squares, right? Another square is Star Jones. 
So I don't know Star that well. I only know her from doing the views. So I go up to her at lunch, and I go, Star, I don't know if you remember me, but, and then Star Jones goes, girl. <laughs> Which can't be good, right? <laughs> so I said, what? And she goes, remember you? We still talk about that day. <laughs> and I, I, I said, what, why? And she goes, in fact, when Barbara's not there, we take turns being you in the dressing room. 